what is going on guys in this video you get a full-on ultimate beginner's guide on how to start playing wulong fallen dynasty this includes how to effectively level up to be stronger in the game how to get the right equipment for the build you want how to make good use of the mechanics and tips and tricks on proceeding through the battlefield levels to lay the groundwork to understand what I'm saying, I'm going to cover some of the basic stuff about these topics and a little bit of what you can expect from the end game. All of this will be kept at minor spoilers just to explain this stuff. So if that sounds interesting, let's get right into it. So we start off with the leveling system and what it affects in the game. You have five phases or virtues that can be level up. These are just stats like strength, for example, only here they are named differently and are only five stats in total. The wood virtue will increase your health the most, whereas leveling up the other virtues does give health, but wood gives you the most. It affects your spirit defense. What the game means by spirit is the mechanic that you have two bars below the health bar, the left will be filled red, the negative side, and the right will be filled blue, the positive side. And with spirit defense, it will reduce the amount the red bar is filled when getting hit. And if the red bar does get filled fully, you will be exhausted, so you cannot do anything for a few seconds, or when you do get hit, you can move afterwards. The wood set will increase your spell duration, which will extend the time of your buffing and debuffing. It will increase your overall lightning attacks, increase the shock status debuff that gradually decreases spirit, and increases the toxic damage received. The wood set also increases your earth heaviness resistance. The fire virtue affects the amount of spirit gained on your attack, so your blue bar will be filled much faster if you attack enemies. It reduces the usage rate of spirit for your martial arts. These are unique abilities you can perform from your equipped weapon. Using these abilities will cost spirit, so it will fill the red bar, and with this stat, the amount is reduced. It also increases your fire-based attacks, increases the burn status debuff, where they will take damage over time, and increases the ice damage received. The fire stat also increases your metal toxic resistance. The earth virtue will increase the spirit gain when you deflect an attack. This is done by dodging at the perfect time when an attack connects with you in your dodge, or when you stand still but you're mostly moving in the game and dodging. This is by far the main mechanic of Wulong, and you will be doing this a lot, and I say a real lot, like all the time. So if you don't like this mechanic, you will have a hard time playing the game. So this stat will fill the blue bar more on a successful deflect, but do note if you deflect, it will cause you to fill the red bar if you failed, or just want to dodge away. What is okay, because if you press the deflect button multiple times really fast, you will do multiple dodges, costing only one deflect. This stat also increases your max equipment weight, which will affect your agility stat when wearing armor. Agility will affect your spirit spends on martial arts, deflecting and dodging, so it will lower the cost of these when it is high, but increases its cost when it is low. So when you wear lower weight armor, your agility stat is higher, and when wearing heavy armor, your agility stat is lower. With the earth stat, you can make it so that when wearing heavy armor, you can make the agility stat increase while still being beefy. So you can spend less spirit for the actions while wearing heavy armor. The earth virtue will also increase your stone based attacks, increases the heaviness status debuff that increases the spirit damage received and decreases the amount of spirit gained from attacking or deflecting with increased lightning damage received. The earth stat also increases your ice and chill resistance. The metal virtue will increase your spirit sustainability, which means that when your blue bar is filled, it doesn't drop that fast. It also reduces the cost of the wizardy spells, which will fill the red bar when you use them. And with this stat, it will fill the red bar less. This stat will increase your toxin-based attacks and the poison status debuff that gradually takes damage over time. It extends the duration of any other negative effects and increases the flame damage received. The metal stat also increases your lightning shock resistance. The water virtue increases your stealth, which means the damage of a fatal strike to unaware enemies is increased, and it makes it harder for enemies to detect you. It also reduces the cost of using a deflect, so you can spam deflect much more to get a successful deflect needing to stagger the enemy. 
The stat will also increase your ice based attacks. The chill status that increases the automatic spirit depletion during high spirit. So when in the blue bar, while preventing automatic spirit recovery during low spirit. So when in the red bar. With that, it increases the stone damage received. The water stat also increases your fire burn resistance. Now the question is, what virtue should you level up? And do these stats bonuses really matter? Most of them don't, but it comes all down to which wizardy spells and weapons you want to use and slightly which armor. So now let's show how this stuff works with the leveling system. Each phase has its own wizardy spell tree where wood focuses on lightning attacks and buffing teammates, fire on setting things on fire with flame attacks, earth on stone attacks and buffing defenses, metal on using toxic attacks and debuffing the enemy, and as final, water on being cunning and using ice attacks. For each of these spells, you will be needing skill points. These will be unlocked by leveling up, what goes naturally by playing the game, but you will be needing these points in the phases to use these spells. What I recommend is to pick only one spell tree you would like to use and full on level up that phase stat so that you can get the most damage output possible for these spells. You can only equip up to 4 spells, so using other spells from other phases isn't really worth it. Or maybe the buffing and debuffing ones. But in the DLC update, you are able to equip up to 8 wizardy spells, so that's pretty nice. Also with this patch, you are able to gain wizardy spells from boss encounters. And if you do find a spell tree you like, try to make your choice of weapon to be so it scales with the same stat as well. So you get overall more damage from your attacks and spells at the same time. Don't worry though, if you want to try other builds, you can easily change it by using the battle flag and going to the battle preparations. Once you unlock the elder in the hidden village, you can also change your stats for free and save your builds in the battle set menu. Other than wizardry spells, you also got special abilities from your divine beasts. These will let you do unique attacks different for each divine beast. And the damage is scaled from one of the five phases, depending on which it has. Throughout the game, you will find Divine Beasts that scale with each phase that also have a buffing ability that adds the element of it on your weapon with unique buffs that also buffs your teammates. How this works is that you can equip one Divine Beast at a time at the battle flag, and you will be needing to fill the gauge by dealing damage and taking damage if it is full, it will light up by your martial art skills and then you can either use the attack ability called Divine Beast Summoning or the buff ability called Divine Beast Resonation. Each Divine Beast also comes with passive bonus stats where they will have 3 unlocked right at the start but later though, completing missions, a 4th passive bonus slot can be unlocked. There are multiple different weapon types in the game that will have a distinct moveset and scaling. For example, you got your regular sword type, but also the straight saber type. Two weapons that look the same but have different movesets and also scale differently. Within these weapon types, you got a variety of other weapon versions that have minor stat changes than other versions, like that you can block better with it, deal more spirit damage or lesser spirit consumption when deflecting, but it can also belong to a set bonus or have a fixed passive bonus stat. Each weapon version will have a chance of different martial arts skills, but some will have a fixed one dedicated to that weapon's version. Each equipment in the game will have a rarity system from 1 star to 5 star, but the 5 star will only drop after beating the game. What this system adds to the weapons is that 1 star will have 1 passive stat and will increase by 1 for each next rarity of the weapon. And with a rarity of 3 and higher, the weapon will have 2 martial arts skills. That is the only thing the rarity system adds to the weapons. It is minor. Same goes for what it stands for with armor. Also for the accessories. It just adds a passive stat slot the higher the rarity you have it. The game will also have three types of ranged weapons that function the same, only the rate of fire is different, but will have one fixed passive slot between other types, and if it has higher rarity, it gains more passive bonus slots. Also, you have four mini ranged weapons you can use, which are a regular throwing knife, the poison knife, the fire pot, and the pedal. 
For the armor in the game, you will have light, medium, and heavy armor that affects the agility stat and how much damage and spirit damage you take when getting hit. It also gives elemental resistances and passive stat slots depending on how high the rarity is. So when you're not leveling up the earth stat, you have to see which armor is best suited for your playstyle. So the agility stat doesn't affect the spirit consumption of martial arts, deflecting and dodging too much to a point that it makes it unplayable to use these mechanics because you are out of spirit all the time. Some armor will be part of a set bonus. So what this means is that if you wear equipment with the same set bonus, you will gain more passive stats wearing the full set. Armor that doesn't belong to a set bonus will have a fixed passive bonus slot. For the accessories in the game, they focus on giving you more passive bonuses where they will have one fixed one for each different accessory and how higher it is in rarity, the more passive bonus slots it has. Now we're going to cover the upgrade and the embedment system, which is both done by the blacksmith that will be accessible in the hidden village. For upgrading, it is very simple. You will find upgrade materials throughout the level in your playthrough. For upgrading weapons, there is the steel material and for armor, the leather material. And you will get a higher level of that material to increase the equipment to the next plus tier. For weapons, it means that you will increase its damage and also will increase the scaling from the stats. For the armor, it will increase the defense. This is something you want to do whenever you have enough material to upgrade your equipment to the next plus tier because it will make the game a lot easier because you make yourself stronger this way. For the embedment system, this has a lot to do with the passive bonuses you get from the equipment. Because with this, you are able to re-roll them into other passive bonuses to your liking. How this works is when you do salvage equipment, you will get material jewel fragments. With this, you can re-roll a passive bonus on equipment. Do note that the accessories cannot be changed with this. You got a lot of bonuses to choose from and the ones with the circle icon can be put multiple times in a single piece of equipment only not the same bonus and the ones with a different icon are limited to one on that single piece of equipment so if you got a bonus for more damage dealt on your headwear you cannot put more bonuses of that same icon on the headwear but you can still put the damage dealt bonus or other bonuses of the same icon on the gauntlets there are also special passive bonuses that can be stuck into a piece of equipment these are called the Jewelry Essence and these are limited so if you do find them in equipment you can either salvage that equipment or just embed it out to be able to put it in the equipment you're using. This Jewelry Essence also has the icon feature so the ones with the same icon can't be stocked more than once in a single piece of equipment. Alright guys, so the things we covered now are the groundwork for what I'm about to explain next. And that is how to effectively choose your build and how to get the right equipment for it. So when you start the game, you don't have many levels yet. So at this point, focus on which weapons you would like to use. You do have two weapon options, but you can use just one. You can also choose a second one with a different scaling or at least close to the same scaling of the main weapon you like to use. So that weapon will not be totally out of damage or even use two of the same type so the scaling is the same. Once you have chosen a weapon you like, you can focus on leveling points on the virtue that scales the most with your weapon for the most damage output. But also level up the other stats it scales with because eventually... If you have too much in one stat, you will be gaining less damage output than the other stats. So aim for leveling up all stat it scales with around that you get the same damage output when you level them up. When this is done, you can go and pick your wizardry spell tree. You got the most level points in from the virtue because your elemental power is increased for the spells within the tree. So you will be doing more damage and that is overall the main point of them. Then pick a Divine Beast that also scales with the same stat. So it also deals a lot of damage when you do summon it. For the armor choice, there is an easy way to already get a good set of 4 star armor with that it is part of a set bonus. And also how to get a good 4 star weapon you like to use. And this is done by maxing out the Oath level from your Reinforcements Warriors. These are the NPCs you can summon into the battlefield to aid you 
and they will gain experience by accompanying you to level up the oath level. They will also come with the warrior effects, which are passive bonuses that are active when they are in play. And when they are level 5, they will gain a second warrior effect. And on level 10, which is the max level, they will give you their weapon and their armor set, which comes with an unique weapon and set bonus, making it so you gain even more passive bonuses, mostly around dealing more damage with the weapon from the set, which means your build gets stronger. To summon them, you will be needing Tiger Seals. These can be found throughout the game, but mostly you get them if you avenge an online player from a monster that they lost to in their world, but is powered up in your world. This goes automatically most of the time, so don't worry about it. There is also an item to level up your warriors quickly to get the max level. This is called the Cup of Cordiality and can be found in levels throughout the game. But a quick way to get them at the start is to check the titles tab. These are background challenges you can complete to gain personal satisfaction. But also give the Cup of Cordiality when you get fame points. So at the start you probably get them quickly through the easy challenges you complete by just playing. If you look at the warriors in the reinforcements tab, you can see the virtue icon besides them. So this is an indicator that the weapon they're using scales with that virtue. This is a really quick way to get a good 4 star weapon with a 4 star armor set with a good set bonus. So you want to level up the oath to the max as soon as possible if the warrior holds a weapon from the virtue you're leveling the most. When this is done, you have a good weapon and an armor set that you can use your upgrade material on to increase its damage and defense whenever you can to be stronger. What you can do next with your weapon and armor is to change its passive bonuses with the embatment system so it works better with your build. Also be sure to use your ranged weapons because their passive bonuses can also be of great use. For example, you can slot the enemy detection into it. This is very useful because mostly in the game enemies are hiding behind walls so you can be ready for them or even do a stealth fatal strike on them. You can also slot the marking flag detection into your ranged weapon so it's much easier to find all the flags to raise the fortitude rank within the battlefields but more on that later. But you do only benefit from the passive bonuses from the equip range weapons. So if you switch to the other, you gain the passive bonuses from that one. This is really a good thing if you want to go for boss fights because you don't need the enemy and the flag detection there. So you can slot in better bonuses in the other range weapon to help you out in the boss fight. If you do all of this, you will have a good enough build to be strong in the game to make it a lot easier. But now let's get into the mechanics on how you can use your build. So the main thing you will be doing in the game is deflecting attacks and breaking the enemy spirit bar to do a fail strike on them that does a lot of damage and reduces their morale rank. This rank means that on missions or what the game calls battlefields, you have a level within the battlefields and that is the moral rank. So when you face enemies with a higher moral rank than your own, they will be much stronger. For example, they will do more damage and take less damage. This is the most noticeable factor, but if you do have higher moral rank, you are stronger than them. To gain higher moral rank during the battlefields is by damaging enemies. The most you can get is by doing a fatal strike on them, which also reduces their moral rank. And this is done by either doing a stealth fatal strike or by breaking their spirit bar to do a fatal strike. To break the spirit bar of an enemy, it is done by filling the enemy's red bar to the limit and they will be in a spirit disruption state, making them defenseless and open for a fatal strike. You yourself can also be in a spirit disruption state, but enemies won't do a fatal strike on you. However, in online play, invaders can do it. To make enemies in a disruption state much faster, it is done by building up your spirit blue bar and using your spirit attack, which is the heavy attack. You consume your blue spirit to make it deal more damage and shrink the spirit gauge from the enemy. To fill the spirit bar quickly is done by attacking enemies or deflecting attacks, but for the most part, deflecting the critical blows of an enemy will build up your spirit the most. Do note, the critical attacks of the enemies need to be deflected or dodged they cannot be blocked normally, and if you do get hit by a critical blow, your moral rank will be reduced. 
You can indicate when the critical blow is coming, when the enemies light up red with their nervous system displayed. If you do die in the game, you will lose your moral rank and half of your Janu Chi. What is the EXP currency of the game used for leveling? You will respawn by the last battle flag you rested and by the spot where you died, you can pick up your remains to gain your lost mortal rank back and the EXP you lost. If you fail to pick it up before you die again, it will be lost forever. There will also be a fortitude rank, which is the moral rank you will stay at when you die. This rank will be increased when you raise battle flags and marking flags within the battlefields. You do want to get all of them because if you do face the boss and you die, you don't have to farm out enemies to build up your moral rank again because you're just too low of a rank to fight the boss properly. During the battlefields, you can encounter groups of enemies that are linked together with mostly a strong enemy as the leader within the group. The spirit gauges are then linked and if you take down enemies within the group, all enemy spirit bars will shrink making it so that they will be open for a fatal strike much faster. These groups are mostly placed around the next battle flag and must be cleared before the flag can be raised. On the battlefields, you will be able to find unique items. These are Dragon Vein Essence, which increases your healing effect from the Dragon's Cure Pot, whereas the Dragon Vein Crystal increases the usage number limits of the Cure Pot. The Cure Pot is your main healing item in the game and will be refilled every time you rest on a battle flag. Further, you can find cicada shells and also tablets that can be turned in within the hidden village to gain rewards. On the battlefield, you can also encounter a panda that will eat up your item and give you an accessory in exchange where the rarity depends on what rarity the item was that you gave him. This is a good way to get a decent accessory. The panas you find will end up in the hidden village and if you free a guy in the underground prison and talk to him in the hidden village, you will get rewards for the panas following you back to the village. When you hover over the battlefields on the map, you can see which unique items you can find within the mission, so you know where to look out for and if you did find them, their icon will be displayed on the mission screen, so you know you found them. How the game mostly works is when you load up a battlefield, you will get a story cutscene with a potential chance you will automatically get an NPC during this mission because of story reasons. Having an NPC in company will make the game so much easier because the enemies won't focus on you and you can easily overwhelm them, making them unable to even defend themselves. You can remove any NPC at will when using the Willow branch in the item tab. If you want a solo experience, what I recommend to be honest, it makes the game much more enjoyable and intense, but do use the NPCs to level them up to gain their armor and weapon to already get a good gear set for your build, what I mentioned earlier. If you do use NPCs, you can make them do unique attacks on your enemies by using the encourage action. I never really used this because I forgot about it even being there, so it's not that important. For the battle flags you find in the battlefield, these serve as checkpoints and if you do die, you respawn here. If you interact with it, enemies will respawn, but here you can level up the virtue phases with Janu Chi, which is the EXP and is gained by defeating enemies, but also can be gained from Chi stone items. Here you can also switch your Divine Beast, make and switch to different loadouts, and also the Inner Discipline option where you can lower the limit from the Moral rank to make the game harder, but also when you defeat enemies with higher moral rank than your own, the drop rate for rarity items is much higher. You can change your wizardry spells here, further you can travel to other levels. You can also buy some basic items like arrows and also sell your items, which I say you may want to do to get money for embedding equipment, but I recommend just salvaging all your equipment to gain upgrade material and also get unique passive bonus slots with jewelry essence. You can also interact with online play here, so you can make people join your game or set up your own game with a password to play with friends. You can also invade people, but to be honest, the internet connection is just shit, so I didn't even bother using it because people did invade me sometimes, but they kept on teleporting around the area, so I was like, yeah, let's not do that. As final, you can call in your NPCs here and check the leveling progression. At the bottom, you can see deliveries where you can get your DLC items, but also if you got an NPC to the max level, 
you can gain their gear set here to claim it. When you completed the first three missions in the game, you will end up in the hidden village. This serves as a general hub area of the game and you can pretty much do what I said before. Only later in the game, you will encounter the elder and with him, you can reset your virtues to try out other builds that can then be saved in the battle set tab within the battle flag to easily switch from build during the game. You can also buy special items with the currency you get for avenging players that mostly goes automatic but here is how it goes when a player dies in a world from an enemy their grave will be displayed in your world and you can interact with this grave by using a cure pot so you will gain a little bit of moral rank to essentially beat the buffed up enemy that killed a player from the grave but you don't need to interact with the grave because the enemies will be buffed regardless and by buffed up i mean they will have higher moral rank mostly up to one or two ranks if you do take them down you get some accolades and a tiger seal to summon players or npcs to help you out and as final you can also change your character's look by the elder so these are pretty much the mechanics of the game. I do going to give you a sort of walkthrough of how to use the mechanics during a battlefield with tips and tricks you can take advantage of to make the game easier and also what you can expect from the end game. When you start up the battlefield, you mostly already got an NPC in your game. You can either kick them out with the branch or replace them at once you want because there's always a battle flag near where you start the level. So moving forward from the first battle flag, there are going to be sections of a big area, mostly with two paths, the stealthy path or the direct face-to-face -face path. To make it easy, take the stealth path because you can do a free fatal strike from above or behind them. And this already does a lot of damage with lowering their moral rank. And you also gain more moral rank from the fatal blows, making them weaker and yourself stronger. The stealth paths are mostly accessible by walking up the walls. They are marked with white to get to a higher platform to take them out from above. And you do have a double jump to gain more range with your jump. So it's easier to get in range for a fatal blow. You do want to explore every corner of every mission because you can find upgrade materials for your cure pot, the marking flags and the upgrade material to make your equipment stronger. Some areas will have higher moral rank enemies patrolling near the start to guard a high tier item. You can either challenge them or move around them to continue the level to gain more morale rank first and then come back to fight them. If you find a next battle flag spot, there are mostly a group of enemies there with a leader. If you can, you can take out the weaker enemies first and then the big guy or if you can, quickly get rid of the big guy first. Then the weaker enemies have their spirit bar shrunk, so they're easily to deal with. For encountering humanoid enemies, if you parry their attacks, they will fall over, making them open for an attack. But it is not always easy to parry. What I recommend is that when you see an attack coming, you want to parry, but at the same time, hold the block button. Because if you do miss the timing, you will still end up blocking it instead, so you didn't take damage, or at least not a lot. When you do hit humanoid enemies, they will stagger except when they do a critical blow. And some human bosses, they are also immune to staggering when getting hit. For the beefy monster enemies, they will mostly not stagger when hit. So you're going to need to attack between their attacks and parry theirs to build up the spirit bar to either use wizardy spells or do the heavy attack to shrink the spirit bar. So it's easier to do a fatal strike on them to beat them. The main factor of it all is that you need to know what attacks enemies do so you can parry them much easier because you know how to prepare for it, especially for the critical blows. After all, they can only be blocked by parrying or just dodging, but it is much more worth to parry them because then it fills the blue bar to do a heavy attack so you can do fatal strikes much faster to do a lot of damage and reduce their moral rank to make them weaker. Further, some enemies do elemental damage. There are items to cure the status of this elemental effect and also reduce its damage, but I mostly didn't use it, only for bosses to just give me that slight edge. These were some tips when you go through levels, but that was it for the most part. The rest you gotta do yourself. 
If you do beat the game, you can switch to a new game plus version within the traveling tab at the battle flag and enemies will be stronger and enemy bosses morale rank will be capped at 25 which is the maximum rank you can get in levels. Further, you can get 5 star gear. These will only have an additional passive bonus slot so the rarity isn't really that important. But guys, that was the ultimate guide for beginners to get you started with Wulong Fallen Dynasty. I hope this video was helpful and if you do enjoyed it, you can leave a like to support it. And if you got some questions about the game, you can comment down below. If you do enjoy this game, then I recommend checking out Neo 2. It is made by the same developers, Team Ninja. And it is sort of the same game, only the parry mechanic is completely gone. So personally, I like that better. And also got a beginner's guide for that one to help you get started. But that was it for this video. If you want more gaming content like this one, you can subscribe to the channel. If you want to watch me live, you can follow me on Twitch. If you want some live content. And I thank you guys for watching. And I see you in the next one.